T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Flight control, we have no confirmed. So, you're in a relationship. And there are two defining characteristics to that relationship. No growth potential and seeming predictability. Now, if someone were to tell you these are the defining characteristics of an interpersonal relationship, chances are most of us would get cold feet and kind of look for the exit. We are not talking about an interpersonal relationship. We are talking about your relationship with water. And those are the two defining characteristics no growth potential. There will never be new water. All the water that has ever existed and ever will exist is with us on planet Earth now. Seeming predictability. We think we know water. We think we know the hydrologic cycle that we learned about in elementary school. It's either in the air, flowing around us, or frozen as ice. It's not as predictable as it once was. There are three stresses that will be placed on water in the next few decades. Climate change. Back to the predictability. Climate change makes what we think we knew about water not relevant anymore. What used to fall in one place as precipitation, snow, or water may not fall in the volume that it used to, and it may not fall at the time that it used to, we really can't trust what used to happen as any indication of what will happen with the hydrologic cycle. So that's climate change. Number two, population growth. There are already more than 7 billion people on this earth, and we'll add more than 2 billion in the next 25 years. That's a lot of thirsty people. And then the third is demographic shifts. Of these more than 9 billion people that will be with us at 2050, more and more of them, in what is really good news, will pull themselves out of poverty. They'll become middle class. And there are a lot of benefits to becoming middle class. But middle class lifestyles demand more water. So we will have a lot of even thirstier people on the planet. So at this point, we kind of have to take a step back and say, ooh, this is a relationship maybe we're not spending enough time on. We might be neglecting this relationship. It might be time to lean in. So we think of water as this abundant resource everywhere. More than three quarters of the planet is covered with water. We are primarily composed of water. But of all of this seemingly abundant resource, just one percent of all the Earth's water resources are available for us humans and land-dwelling animals. 1%. And we think we know how much water we use. This is a gallon. Now, you can measure water in many different ways as a gallon, as a liter, cubic feet per second, if it's flowing. So many ways to measure how much water we consume. So most of us are familiar with maybe how much of this we drink in a given day. Or maybe we're familiar with how many of these it will take to fill a bathtub. Well, that is not even the first bit you need to know about this relationship with water. Yes, you might have a sense of what you're actively consuming, but there is a lot more of this in what is called embedded water consumption that you need to learn about. As with any relationship, as you take that first step, acknowledging you might have a problem, time to lean in, time to work on this relationship, you need to know what water's priorities are. What is important to water? Well, there are two primary concerns for water. Food and electricity. You cannot grow or raise any food without a lot of this. And you cannot generate electricity, nor can you move water from one place to another or heat it or cool it without a lot of electricity. These relationships, these inextricably linked relationships, are called nexus relationships. 
And just briefly, you should become aware of the two biggest water nexus relationships, water and food and water and energy. So to bring this down to our consumer level, we're all familiar with the food we eat and we think about our water consumption when we're having a meal as the glass of water that accompanies that meal. There's so much more to the story. Let's take one eight ounce serving of steak. It will take 900 of these to get that piece of steak to your plate. 900 of these in one eight ounce serving of steak. So now, the other nexus relationship we should all become a little more familiar with if we want to save this relationship. Electricity. This is a 60 watt incandescent bulb. If you were to burn this for about eight hours a day over the course of the year, you'd need about 6,000 of these. So now that you have a better understanding of what are the greatest constraints or the greatest challenges, the greatest priorities for water, it's now that time in improving the relationship where you look within. I work with the One World, One Water Center at Metropolitan State University of Denver, co-run by Denver Botanic Gardens. This is an interdisciplinary water studies program. Interdisciplinary is the key element and the distinguishing factor to this. For too long, we've relied on just a few people to face these challenges that we see in the forefront on water, to face population growth, demographic change, and climate change. We have assumed the hydrologists and the engineers are gonna make sure that this is pulled up from the ground or pulled from our lakes and transported where it needs to be, when it needs to be. We've also assumed that biologists and chemists will be the ones who keep it potable, drinkable, safe. Well, we've seen too many examples near and far, most recently in our own country, Flint, Michigan. We have not been investing the necessary money and infrastructure to rely on this being potable. So through my work with OWOW, the One World, One Water Center, great acronym, I've been able to travel the world and talk with people from the Four Corners on water and their relationships with water. Sadly, in many parts of the world, the relationship that individuals have with water has been defined for them. They are not in a position to define their relationship. Through Oh Wow, this interdisciplinary approach, we acknowledge that everyone has some contribution to make to facing these crises that lay ahead with regard to water. We talk about water being a fill-in-the-blank issue. Yes, it's an electricity and energy issue, it's a food issue, it's an environment issue. It's also a gender issue, it's socioeconomic, it's education. Let's just follow the, the thread of one example. In developing world countries, it's not uncommon for girls and women to be charged with getting water. There's not been investment in infrastructure and there is no nearby potable, reliable water source. So you'll take a situation that starts as a gender issue. A girl is charged with her responsibility to her family or her village to go fetch clean water. That will take her several hours to walk more than four miles a day. That's an average in many parts of India and some parts of Africa. It is not uncommon for girls to have to drop out of school because they have to go fetch water. So what started as a gender issue is an education issue. They're no longer going to school. And then it becomes a socioeconomic issue those same girls having not edu been educated and not being able to continue their education don't enter the workforce. And then it's a global development issue. The GDP of those countries are adversely affected. They're limited by more than half of uh, the population not being able to plug in. So we in the developed or a wealthy world scenario are very fortunate. We still have time to develop our relationship with water. So back to the things that uh, are familiar to us and are water's greatest priorities, energy and food. They're just two examples to get you started on changes that you can make that will make a difference. 
that eight ounce serving of steak, you can switch it out to chicken and you can save 700 gallons. 900 gallons becomes 200 gallons of your embedded water consumption. And energy, simply just turn off the light when you leave the room, that's the best starter. But beyond that, you can change out the light bulb from a high energy, high water consuming light bulb, like an incandescent bulb, to an LED bulb. You're reducing your water consumption by 80% just doing that. So each of us has our own spin on our relationship, our own contribution, our own key to making this relationship with water work. It may be changing your diet, it may be changing the way you consume electricity. There are more than nine billion people and each of us will eventually have to figure out how we fill in the blank. Water is a fill in the blank issue. Take a step back, see the changes that you can make in your everyday lifestyle to reduce your water consumption. And that is how we stand the best chance of living happily ever after with water. Thank you.